of the National Trust. Then on my left is Theresa Villas, Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Then on my right, uh, James Brokenshire, MP for Old Bexley and Sidcup. Um, my far right is um, Carl Wilding, Chief Executive of the National Council of, National Council of Voluntary Organisations. So um, why are we talking about parks and green spaces and their role in our towns and cities? Well, for, for policy exchange, over the past, well, more than over the past year, we've talked quite a lot about beauty. Um, and we, yeah, I'm very much thanks to James, um, more than anything. Um, and we've normally talked about beauty in terms of housing. Um, we, we strongly believe that we need more beautiful housing, but we also need more beautiful places. And um, what we're really talking about, we're not, we're not just interested in the aesthetics of new homes. We want to give people like, the best living environment possible. And buildings are one part of that, but you know, places like your parks and your green spaces are as important, if not more so. So um, that's why we're talking about it today. So um, why are parks and urban spaces important? Well, they're really important to people's health, their well-being, almost like a place's identity as well. Um, they, they're places where communities come together, where they interact, um, where they're part of our heritage. They also have huge um, environmental benefits with air quality benefits and the like. Um, and it's not just the kind of the greenery. It's also, the, I was thinking about this before chairing, actually. Um, it's the playgrounds and the cafes and all the, all, the, all the parts of parks and green spaces that we really um, um, enjoy and we uh, care about. Um, but the reason why we talk, want to talk about this today as well is that um, across, well, local authorities who tend to have responsibility for parks, um, they have faced a number of budgetary pressures over the past um, few years. And uh, there's now a change relationship between local authorities and parks and communities. And this brings into question how, we, how can we kind of protect our urban parks and green spaces? Um, are there new models of um, funding and managing um, these vital assets? So um, that's why we're holding today's event. Um, we have a great range of speakers from community groups to secretaries of state, former secretaries of state and brilliant MPs to the director general of the National Trust. So I'm going to first hand to Hillary. Uh, to speak for four or five minutes, and then we'll go to uh, Teresa, and then to Councillor Greenhouse, then to uh, Carl, and then to James. And then please have brilliant questions ready that are a sentence long and end in a question mark. <laughs> so, Hilary. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, to talk about this really, really important subject um, for me, for the National Trust, but more importantly for this great country. Um, I want to start with a little bit of personal uh, reflection as to why parks are important to me. Um, you might have guessed from my accent, I'll try to talk slowly. I'm from Northern Ireland, um, and I was uh, born 1966, two years before the Troubles started. And, and during that period of the Troubles, as it was referred to, it was very, very difficult to find anywhere in Northern Ireland that wasn't a place that was segregated, that was a place for one side over the other side. And... Our parks were one of the very few places that that was the case, that you could go and be you um, and not have a label attached to you. And I have always, always held very strong affection for the importance of parks as a place to be able to go, to convene, to bring people together. And that's always stayed with me. And, and so I end up in a job as Director General for the National Trust and... In a way, I've got, I've got this opportunity to work with an organisation that believes passionately in the importance of place, places for people, places for nature, and, and to think a bit more about why parks in particular plays such an important role in that. And, and the more I think about it, the more I think actually that goes right back to what our founders of the National Trust, Octavia Hill, really wanted to achieve, she wanted to make sure that people mostly living in urban areas had access to green space, which she called to fresh air, to the outdoor living rooms. So for the National Trust to be involved in this really important issue seems entirely natural and a natural fit. And, and some people do say, well, but you've got lots of your own parks, why are you looking at urban parks? Well, quite simply, it's where the need is greatest. And let's not be shy of the fact there is a significant need at the moment for parks. The proportion of local councils who are now reducing their budgets for parks to zero is growing. Every year that there's more and more and more pressure. It's not a statutory requirement. Question mark, should it be? Some people think it should. I, I for one, think that statutory um, requirement wouldn't necessarily solve the problem. Libraries are a statutory requirement, aren't they? And they haven't necessarily escaped. So 
there is a problem. Our parks do not have the funding and support to sustain them. But the need is never greater and the desire for care of our parks has never been greater. I bet you, you out there, your constituents will tell you how important these, these places are to them. And, and they vote by their feet. 36 million people used their local park last year. It's an extraordinary number and an extraordinary sense of desire to care. And there is a desire to want to have ownership and, and play a part in caring for these parks. It doesn't need to be government that looks after it or even the local authority looks after it. They want to take ownership. So the trust has teamed up with the National Lottery Heritage Fund, I've changed the name and it's quite hard to get your mouth around, but anyway, <laughs> to engage in a program that we're calling Future Parks Accelerator, which essentially works with a small number of local authorities to try to find new models to care for their parks. We have a small pot of money, five million, and the National Trust are putting in uh, support and kind. And we put a bid out there to say, who's interested? We had 92 responses, 92 local authorities who said, we need, we need help. We can only accommodate eight. So we know there's a need. We know there's interest. We know there's public support. And I'm keen to hear from you today as to how we can move this agenda forward because it's so, so very important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I am delighted to be here at Policy Exchange. Thank you to, uh, to Policy Exchange for putting on this event and coming to the Conservative Party conference and also a very warm thank you to the National Trust for doing the same. We all know that coming to the conference can be a, an exhausting business and um, I'm gr so grateful to the, the community of think tanks, organisations like the National Trust, the wider business community who help make this a really exciting occasion for our for our members and this particular issue I think is very well chosen our parks and open spaces in in cities and suburbs are just crucial to our quality of life it's it's been a long-standing local campaigning priority for me as MP for Barnet there's there are a few things that get people more upset than the idea that their their local parks might be under threat or in some way not looked after so I think it's, it's entirely appropriate for policy exchanges focus on quality of life in our towns and cities to have decided to focus on, on parks today. And I very much agree that parks do provide a really important range of benefits, some of which that uh, we, we, don't, we wouldn't normally sort of think about on an everyday basis, but on things like air quality improvements, flood risk prevention, urban cooling, carbon sequestration, conservation of habitats and biodiversity. All of these things are um, important policy priorities that can be assisted by good quality parkland in our cities. And our 25-year environment plan that we published recently commits us to connecting more people closely with the natural environment in order to improve health and well-being. And there is a focus in that plan on areas of the country where there isn't enough accessible park and open space, particularly in towns and cities with high deprivation. And we see parks and green spaces as a kind of wider green infrastructure. And we, our plan commits us to drawing up a national framework for green infrastructure standards. And that's being taken forward by Natural England and essentially, it's asking the question, well, what amounts to good quality parks and green space? We're trying to work to produce criteria to answer that question, which can help guide planners, designers, and communities deliver the parks and green spaces that work for them. And we hope this will, in due course, feed into the planning system as well. And we expect and hope to publish that frame, framework for, for green infrastructure standards in the relatively near future next year. And of course, a commitment to net zero, which we've made as a government a historic commitment, does mean that we need to look uh, more closely at what parks can do to help us meet that, uh, that aggressive carbon reduction target that we've set ourselves. And I think it's always worth bearing in mind that we've, uh, we've had a lot of discussion about carbon capture technology. Well. Um, Trees and uh, open spaces are, our, uh, are a ready-made form of carbon capture technology which uh, we need to utilise. 
So I think that we need to undertake a big uplift in tree planting. We made announcements uh, at this conference about uh, supporting new forests in Northumberland to build on the work that's being done in relation to the northern forest. But I think also that tree planting program can be part of, we can see it manifest itself in some of our urban parks as well. And I do hope, I mean, we've talked about funding. I know this is, this is very much a live issue. We all, we're all aware that local government has, has uh, been subject to some very difficult budget decisions over the course of the last, uh, last nine years or so. The most recent spending round was the most generous settlement for local government for a while, but it is still difficult for local authorities to find the resources they want to devote to their park. So I'm afraid that's yet another reason why we have to grapple with putting social care on a sustainable basis for the future so that it no longer puts quite so much pressure on local authority budgets. And um, another stream of, of the government's work relating to parks is to use them in our efforts to improve mental health in this country. Our 25-year environment plan acknowledges what I think we all instinctively know to be true, that spending time in the natural environment can improve mental health and well-being. It can reduce stress, fatigue, anxiety, depression, and also have a sort of physical effect on boosting immune system and encouraging physical activity. And um, you know, there's evidence to indicate that that kind of outdoor activity can reduce the risk of chronic conditions such as asthma. So the government's made a commitment to use green spaces as our strategy to improve mental health care. And we've got work going across, going amongst DEFRA, NHS England, Public Health England, and Natural England to take forward uh, social prescribing um, proposals. And programs are underway in eight locations on nature-based prescribing. So instead of giving people tablets, um, giving them a series of um, activities to engage in instead. And uh, those associated with exercise and open spaces, I think, have a real possibility to improve um, mental health and tackle conditions like anxiety and depression. And we're bringing local partners together to determine what sort of a project on social prescribing has the best results. And... An important further programme we're undertaking in relation to our parks is in Chapter 3 of our Environment Plan to encourage children to get closer to nature, both in and outside of school. We recognise that uh, learning and playing outside is an invaluable part of, of, of childhood, and our 10 million children in nature programme has a particular focus on children from disadvantaged backgrounds and includes... Um, attempts to uh, reconnect them with parks and the natural environment. But lastly, I want to talk about litter. Um, it is something that blights our parkland. Tackling it is one of the most effective ways we can encourage people to enjoy their parks and the outdoor life. Um, so we have hiked up the fines for littering and we have a manifesto commitment to improve the accountability for, uh, to hold to account those responsible for dealing with litter. And I hope to make some progress on this in the Environment Bill. And, of course, we've got a big plan to move to a more circular economy and ensure that the, com the companies that produce plastic packaging take on the cost of disposing of that packaging as well. And uh, I hope that the efforts we're making to grapple with the menace <coughs> of litter, um, something which exasperates me and many of my constituents, I hope that uh, in driving that forward to make us a, um, a less litter-strewn country, um, that will be something we can do to enhance the beauty of our parks and open spaces. Councillor Greenhalgh, can you provide a kind of local authority perspective? I can, hopefully. Um, I mean, first of all, I want to say that I think this is absolutely the right territory that the Conservative Party should be in. We should be absolutely fighting for uh, our local parks and uh, green spaces. And I say that from someone who's... We've only been in uh, control of, of Bolton since May, um, and my exec member is sat right in front of you there who's delivered on it. But one of our first priorities was that we actually um, gave £1.5 £1. into the Cleaner Greener agenda. 
councils are revenue poor. Uh, what they need to prioritise when they get capital receipts and one-off spending is to raise this higher up the agenda. And this is the key challenge. Uh, it was something that we decided to do, as well as a big investment on roads. Uh, but we saw it as equally important. And uh, we put uh, a considerable amount of money into parks and green spaces. And we have also planted trees and wildflowers along our main arterial routes into the town, which were looking particularly shabby. Um, so we think this is a, an area that we absolutely should be uh, prioritising. Um, I want to speak a little bit parochial, if I can, and locally, um, about... Um, a community group that I've become heavily involved in right from the start, which is on one of, our, one of my local parks in my ward, um, started your typical story of Birchia derelict park, underused, children's play over the boat, had, had more pieces of equipment removed because they were dangerous than actually were actually on, on the play area. Group of parents and councillors got together, formed a group. Um, six years on, that park is a community hub. We've attracted over £150,000 of investment into that park. We've got match funding from the council. Uh, we're not just, it's not just a park for a play area. We've had theatre on that park, culture. We've got gym equipment. Um, it's as much a well-being park as it is a play area. And it's about you know, finding a, a way of reinventing our parks as well and making them a vibrant part of that community. We've just had the tour of Britain travel straight past the park through, through the ward. Fantastic piece of land art on there, brought the whole community together, children, and also something which is fantastic is that, and it was brought up um, by the minister about uh, children becoming involved. Um, right from an early stage, we get children volunteering on that part, whether it's litter picks or whether it's planting bulbs or uh, all, all sorts of activities. We have the play, play areas all on the park during the summer holidays. And the antisocial behaviour in that area has diminished incredibly. I'm not saying they're not getting up to uh, nonsense in other places, but they certainly have ownership of that park and there's not any, any bother we get from teenagers on that part whatsoever because they can have a bit of ownership on that part themselves and growing up and it's something that's very special to them so so i think it's absolutely um crucial uh, uh, that we do that um and i think it's important as well historically of course and quite naturally it always sits in environment but this is also very much as was alluded to earlier a much a public health issue a well-being issue and we've we've got a portfolio holder that, that total responsibility is well-being and uh, anti-poverty and deprivation and it's hugely important that that post covers all areas and it's about something I further wanted to talk on because we've seen certainly in both in London and in Birmingham a, uh, a national park status uh, growing. Um, we haven't sadly yet in GM, it's something that I'm pushing for. We actually did a, a, a motion to our council last year which kind of fell under the radar a little bit but it was supported by Michael Gove, the idea of an, an urban green heart, a kind of regeneration through conservation idea that really there's so much regeneration going on, especially in our urban areas, that really the green agenda should be so much at the heart of that. There is a real opportunity, so many of our northern towns are really flattening and starting again. There is a real opportunity there to actually build that green agenda, to plant trees, to build, to create green spaces uh, within our urban centres. And we have to grasp that opportunity, not just talk about being carbon neutral, but being carbon positive as well when we do that. So I'll hand over, but great opportunities ahead. Nicole. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm lucky enough to live in a rural area, uh, a small village called Wee Hampstead, uh, uh, just outside St Albans. And, uh, and just recently, the partnership uh, between uh, the district council and community groups in my area has restored uh, a 19th century uh, Victorian crinkle crankle garden, if that means anything uh, uh, to any of you. Uh, it's worth visiting, I, I promise you. It's, it's, they're quite a rare thing. But what I wanted to say is that the sort of the engine that's been behind that has been people who get involved in their community. It's been people who volunteer. They've created not only an aesthetic space that's, that's pleasing to the eye, but a sensory garden there. You know, it's obviously contributed to the heritage of the village. But it's people getting involved that's primarily 
behind that, people who give their time and volunteer and get involved. And I unashamedly want to say to you today that the link between green spaces and getting involved is something that we should celebrate and, and nurture. It's not just about sort of thing, things like gardens that are aesthetically pleasing. Uh, I could talk about the Trust for Conservation Volunteers and the Green Gym scheme that they run that's about people exercising and volunteering uh, at the same time. In York, there's a project called Growing Green Spaces that's a similar sort of uh, exercise and volunteering. And uh, could you put your hand up if on a Saturday morning at 9 o'clock you go for a run and do five kilometres in your local park at a park run? If I'm not on the Today programme. <laughs> yeah. Parkrun is one of the biggest growing organisations, not just in this country, but worldwide. And it's an exemplar of not only the importance of green spaces, but the modern way in which people choose to participate and get involved. And all those things that Theresa talked about in terms of that agenda around health and well-being, Parkrun is an exemplar of that. Though I note in passing that, that, that there was one example a couple of years ago where one local authority actually banned parkrun from their space because they were using the space. I mean, I, 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 I don't quite sort of get that. And also, uh, Teresa, there's a junior parkrun that started near us as well for young people uh, to answer your sort of question. I want to be very clear that getting involved is good for you. We, we, we got data from NCVO. Uh, at NCVO, we've just done a piece of work called Time Well Spent that, that, that shows there's a clear link between the fact that people feel less isolated when they get involved. And what surprised us when we did the research recently was actually that was uh, uh, most evident for young people. They found volunteering was, was a, a really important solution for them in terms of the loneliness that they felt. And getting involved is also a way of bridging between communities. Though I'm thinking about another green space that's just near me, the uh, uh, Hartwood Forest, for those of you that might know the Woodland Trust, where, you know, I mean, it's not always about bridging between communities. There's a bit of a fight at times that goes on between the horse riders and the dog walkers uh, uh, and the runners. But there you go. So... Volunteering, I think, changes your life, and, and green spaces have a role to play in that, and we should celebrate volunteering. But, vo but that participation, it needs spaces and places. It's not just green spaces, it's youth clubs, it's village halls, and, and, and so on. And I guess one message that I have is that if I'm right that volunteering changes your life, I think we need to recognise that while seven out of ten people have volunteered at some point in their life, three out of ten people have never volunteered ever. Okay. And I think one of the things that we have to think about is that if volunteering is that leg up that I think it is, mm. if people aren't volunteering, they're going to fall further behind. And we've got to make sure that those people have access to volunteering opportunities. And I think many of those volunteering opportunities take place in the green spaces that we're sort of talking about uh, uh, here. So the final thing that I wanted to say is, is to talk to the community assets agenda that all the speakers, I think, have talked to uh, uh, so far. And clearly these, are sort of, uh, these have been difficult times over the last decade in terms of the public finances. And, and it strikes me that I, I want to reiterate that philanthropy and volunteering, they have a role to play in this agenda. But they are not the solution to everything. You can't just dump these assets onto communities and expect them to be self-sustaining. Just as we can't just put libraries into the hands of volunteers and expect those volunteers to not only run the library but also pay for the heating and the lighting and the purchase of the books. This has to be a partnership, not just between the state and philanthropy and the community, but also with business as well. So for me, some of the knotty questions going forward are, how do we trust people? How do we put them in control of these assets that are so important to them? How do we develop that partnership between the public, the private, uh, and the community? And how do we sort of make the best of what each has to offer? Because they've all got something to contribute, but I don't think any of them can do it on their own. Thank you. James. Thank you. And at the outset, can I thank uh, Policy Exchange, not just for today, but for banging on about beauty in the way that you have over quite some considerable time. Beauty, yes, in the built environment, but I know that that means how it is set within the natural environment, which naturally takes us into today's discussion about parks. Now, I'll let you into uh, a little secret. 
Um, I know that over recent months I have become more famed about my four ovens and baking and stuff like that. But I tell you, what I'd like to do actually uh, beyond that is going out, enjoying the green spaces around where I live in Bexley. And we are very, very lucky in having beautiful parks and uh, lovely woodland and that space that you can enjoy. And it makes you think about that relationship to place and beyond that, your own identity the way that we relate to the places that we live in and how parks and open and shared spaces are profoundly a part of that. Shared spaces that we have shared experiences, whether that yes be doing the park run or going out and walking the dog or simply just enjoying the natural environment around you. And how I think we do have to champion that more and also look at ways in which we can enhance that and develop it. It also gives a strong sense of community too. And certainly something that I've campaigned on over many, many months and beyond is how as conservatives, we can recapture that sense of the community's agenda. Who we are, where we live, where we relate to, what are those shared spaces? how we do make that connectivity within one another. That's why I published the Communities Framework just before the summer to start to develop some of those ideas that Carl has, I think, rightly highlighted. How we can look at where there are good models of partnership between local community groups, yes, between business and councils and other parts of government too, to ensure that we can enhance our parks and our green spaces and that shared sense of where we come from and who we are. Of course, there are some really important initiatives. Pocket parks, the support that we've given to that for community groups to effectively create or support new or existing parks too. The work that you've heard from the National Trust on the Parks Accelerator, which I think is really innovative, something that we do need to support. But how we then take that beyond the local, how there's almost that seamlessness from, we were just discussing before we came in, almost like the, uh, the plants on the balcony through to your back garden, through to your park, through to your forests and your national parks. And I profoundly want to see more national parks preserving and cherishing and treasuring our grand open green spaces. How I warmly welcome the announcement that we've seen at the conference this week about the great Northumberland forest, that commitment to a million trees being planted between 2020 and 2024. Yes, that, that real sense of ambition that we should have. And I think it was notable that in Julian Glover's interim report on our national parks and our areas of outstanding national beauty, that was his key theme, I think, on a sense of ambition and what we can do. So I think that we as conservatives should really get behind this agenda of place, of people, of pride. But I also think we need to ensure that we challenge on the basis of inclusion. One thing that really angered me over the course of my time as community secretary was to discover this sense of segregation the fact that you live in social housing, well, you can't use that green space. You can't use that park over there. That's why I changed some of the guidance and regulation on how we then look at new planning. But to see an example again in the course of the last week of some green space in West London that was being denied to some people simply because of where they lived. That's unacceptable. And as Conservatives, I think that we must and do need to challenge and stand up to that. Because it is that sense of providing shared spaces for all, opportunity for all, that I think lies at the heart of the Conservative credo. And therefore, with that sense of ambition of what we can do with our green spaces to strengthen community, to strengthen that sense of place and identity, but also that sense of opportunity for people to share, and if we can capture that, which I think we can, we can look forward positively 
as to what we Conservatives can do to champion parks, but do so much more by doing so. Uh, thank you, James. Um, that's brilliant. We heard about the changing uses of parks with park runs, but I mean, at their heart, they still remain shared places. We've heard about the new pressures that are placed on um, parks, but despite those pressures, there is still a huge importance of protecting their use for generations to come. That's why new models matter. And I, the, the fact that 92 local authorities saying they need the help is a, a hugely important thing. And how you take these new models beyond the local, as you said, James, seems to be a big task. So um, enough from me. I'm going to go to the audience for some questions, which are a sentence song, end in a question mark. And please introduce your names, uh, name and where your, your organization before you speak. So uh, there's a gentleman right at the back, and then there's a lady around four rows back on. Yes, on the way. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Owen Pugh from the Woodland Trust. Um, I wanted to thank you all for your fantastic um, work that you've been doing across the many months uh, that you've been doing. And of course, thank you for the mention of Hartwood as well, which I am very familiar with personally. Um, my question really is um, about, uh, since many local authorities have suffered um, many funding um, sacrifices in the last uh, 10 years, um, many local parks are now facing a biosecurity challenge um, in that, you know, try and find a local park in London, for example, that doesn't have oak processionary moth. And I promise you, it's going to be hard not to find one that's facing that problem. Um, so there is a biosecurity challenge, um, and our parks need um, a new breed, as it were, of, uh, of trees, a new sense of natural regeneration uh, to come forth. So uh, I would like to know what um, support um, the panel can perhaps provide um, to, uh, a, to calling for a uh, UK sourced and grown policy of replenishment in our natural parks, that trees that are going to be replacing the diseased um, fellows of their kith and kin um, are going to be um, biosecure um, from our own native stock, as it were. Okay. And then the lady for is back with you. Thank you. My name's Mary Dad. I'm chairman of um, Ongar Neighbourhood Plan um, Community Group and also a member of Ongar Civic Trust. Um, we very much want to have a new town park. We have got a deficit of, even though it is a, um, a very small, Chipping Ongar is a very small town in an, um, a rural area. Um, it's been designated that we have, or it's stated that we have not got a town park. We've got going to have quite a lot of new houses, and we want to provide some uh, a new park. Um, we have got a landowner who um, may uh, provide such, but obviously with strings attached. But what my question is is pocket parks and various other um, streams of funding that we've looked at. We don't seem to be able to. Um, uh, be, be appropriate, what other funding can um, the Conservative Party and the environment um, uh, uh, policy that's coming forward help us because our um, local councils do not have the money to, um, to do this? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Hilary, there's a question there around replenishment of parks and around new parks funding from government. Okay, so... Um on the biosecurity issue, I think it's a really super important question. Um, relates to climate change, it relates to so many things. So there, I don't think there is a single answer here because it's going to be cross-governmental, isn't it? Um, and it absolutely points to the challenge that actually this needs a joined-up approach. Just like we talked about, this is as much about well-being as it is about beauty, as it is it about access. It's also about these very, very fundamental um, challenges. So I think there is a role for government uh, in terms of really grappling with... It's not just... The biosecurity is a consequence of climate change, isn't it? Um, so you have got to get to the root of the problem, and, and I applaud, I think, um, and, and some of the announcements over the last number of days have... have been very positive in that direction, but probably not far enough. There, there absolutely needs to be a clear understanding of what we will do about these biosecurity issues, but local parks themselves need to know how to go about this. There needs to be more guidance, there needs to be clarity as to who to go to, and I think, I think there is a lot more to be done in that area. I'm afraid I, I can't answer your question. I'd love to be able to give you money to <laughs> have your time part. I might defer to my colleagues to get an answer to that, but I, I think it's a challenge that I'm hearing quite frequently, people wanting to create 
um, accessible parks for, for everyone. But, yes. Yes. But, but the funding is still not there. And it's likely to be a, a combination and a menu of um, people to support, but I'll defer. Theresa, would you like to tackle that question? Well, as I, as I said in my open remarks, I mean, I, I fully recognise the, the difficult decisions there have been on local authority funding over the last nine years. There's, there's no getting away from it that uh, local councils in England have found it difficult to do all that they need to do with the resources available to them. And I hope, I mean, we, as I've said, the spending round started to see that change, but um, there are always going to be competing, uh, you know, a, a, a difficult competition for resources um, for uh, limited local authority budgets. But we do have this commitment to becoming a net zero carbon economy. That does mean that we will have to invest in nature and our open spaces. And so I foresee that that, that should be a, a source of funding in the future for the creation of new parks and the enhancement of the parks we already have. Um, I mean, obviously, there are various streams that are underway at the moment, but I appreciate they can be quite difficult to access. But certainly, given that we've made this commitment, um, and as I said in my opening remarks, becoming, becoming a net zero economy means a strong focus on... Uh, on biodiversity, on wildlife, on the natural environment, so that we create those, those uh, that that plant and animal life to lock up that carbon. Um, that I, I very much hope will create some opportunities for communities to create new parks in the future. And as I said, another key issue here is we do have to sort out a financial. Um, we, we need to sort out financial stability for the social care sector, so we relieve that pressure on local authority budgets too. Carl, you wanted to jump in. I go up and down the country and I meet people like you who are incredibly angry and frustrated about they want to do stuff in their community and they can't find the resources to do it. And the only answer that we ever seem to try and reach for is government. We've got to try and be a bit more creative and a bit more imaginative in terms of trying to think, how do we endow local places? How do we build pots of money? By, and we build those by approaching philanthropists and we can use government money and we can use mechanisms like community foundations so that people like you are close to decision makers that have got money to spend. We have dormant assets available that are just sitting there that we could put into the hands of local people for you to decide. The solutions are there, and it's not just government. Uh, James, do you want to come in, and then uh, Councillor Greenhouse after you? Yes. It's interesting to hear the example of uh, Onga, a place I know reasonably well, on the doorstep of Epping Forest, not too far away, with all of that wonderful green space that we have there. But also the fact of neighbourhood plans and that sense of community, how I think we have still got to do more to embed and strengthen that community design and how neighbourhood plans... I think also looking at how we look at town and village councils and, uh, and uh, parish councils as well and the role that they should play in the 21st century, the conversation we need to do to strengthen that. It's also allied to a concept that uh, I, I was giving some thinking to on environmental net gain. So in other words, if we develop what the quid pro quo of that is, well, we know the relationship between the built environment and the natural environment, if we're really to shape places, and therefore how with uh, community planning plus that sense of environmental net gain, how that may also unlock other sources of funding and finance to actually make places that we should be proud of, that are beautiful, that we can look for the future on having set that, uh, set that down. Uh, and also, I do commend the, the incredible work of the Woodlands Trust, uh, having uh, the uh, benefit of having... Uh, some woodland that is uh, stewarded by you. Uh, you know, yes, there are no easy, I think, answers. I think it is about joining partners together. But equally, I know the work that you have done through the uh, Queen's Commonwealth Canopy and some of those other initiatives is how we plant more trees and being thoughtful as to how we do that, which is why I think some of the commitment that the government is now doing needs to do that in partnership with people like yourselves to ensure that we do that smartly 
think about biodiversity, think about biosecurity, and therefore our planning for the future. Uh, Councillor Greenhut. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling, uh, like others on the panel, that this will uh, can become higher on the agenda for tree planting now with the commitments we've made to being uh, carbon neutral. Uh, those of you that are aware of the politics in this part of the world will know that we have legal challenge on most councils in this area on our clean air. So it's a huge uh, issue uh, for us locally. Um, I think also we have to think outside the box a little bit. It's not, we're not too far away from a scheme that um, was a fantastic uh, community scheme where uh, there was house building, trees were being lost. Uh, they got all the local school children to go around and gather the seeds from those trees and replant them in other areas so that the generations of those trees uh, were not lost completely. I think initiatives like that really bring communities together and, and get them uh, really um, involved in, in a whole kind of uh, project of planting trees. And I think we just need to get the PR a little bit better on this. I mean, I know you all do a fantastic job in both your organisations, but I think we just need to um, make people aware of the, the huge importance uh, of this issue. Um, but also, I, I do meant to go back to my original point that for councils, if you're planting trees, this is not going to take away from frontline delivery. Planting of trees is a capital expenditure. It is not going to take away from your day-to-day -day delivery of the revenue budget. So it's up for councils to prioritise this. And um, not all councils are, are capital rich, and I don't want to use that term, but they do get capital, they have capital assets that they can uh, get receipts from. And it's up to them to make those decisions and prioritise that moving forward. And just going quickly to Onga, um, I think um, if, if I was on your council and I, I heard you mention house building, um, I would make sure that you get a great deal of Section 106 money. Uh, for your green spaces. You know, the, the primarily of that is that we've just had quite a lot of house building. Um, we've got a lot of house building going on in Bolton. Uh, and part of the structure is education, health is predominantly always the ones that are chosen. Get green on the agenda. Make sure you get 106 money. So all that houses that you're going to get built, you want some green return on it. So make sure you, you fight for that section 106 money from your developers who will get a lot of money from building houses in your area. Uh, let's go for a couple more questions on this side of the room. Uh, there's a lady just on the left there, and then the gentleman at the front. Hello, I'm Alison Ogden-Newton. I'm the Chief Executive of Keep Britain Tidy. Um, we uh, administer the Green Flag Scheme, which um, is the quality um, mark for um, open and green spaces. And whilst it's never actually been more popular than it is at the moment, we also appreciate from our 15,000 um, volunteer Friends of Parks and also the Eco Schools programme we run in 19,600 schools, that parks are under real pressure and play equipment's being lost, kids aren't having the kind of access that they need. Um, I was absolutely thrilled that the Secretary of State mentioned litter, obviously, um, but also the very direct correlation between non-recyclable um, packaging. Um, I've been serving on the Parks Action Group, and thank you to the Minister for his support to the Parks Action Group. But the, the, the connection's been made, and I'm really anxious to hear what the panel thinks, between the hypothesised tariff on um, plastic packaging that can't be recycled in particular. Um, um, I know the government set a target of making sure that all packaging can be recycled and for those that can't there will be an additional tariff served. Could we not make a correlation between that tariff and our open spaces and start using some of that money, should it be forthcoming, to invest in the kind of space we all want? Because I know it's been touched on here, but there is such a phenomenal strength, there's a really strong argument that stable, happy, um, safe communities where people are healthier and they circulate and they, they have much more positive social interactions are all based around public space. And you cannot underestimate the silent and absolutely phenomenal um, quality that public space offers very um, importantly to people who, for whom um, social disadvantage is, is at the highest. So Thank it you. should be a priority. And the gentleman at the front. Thank you, uh, Bruce Buckland. I'm an architect based in Hampstead. Um, building slightly on the previous question on litter, um, we've had a very, very successful anti-smoking campaign running for over a decade now, uh, which has made a massive difference. Can we please have the same thing for litter to try and change people's behaviour and make sure our parks are kept tidy from the very source? Uh, 
Hilary, do you want to take either of those? Um, yeah. <laughs> I was in a similar panel before. I, we, we all were violently agreeing with each other, um, <laughs> That's good. which is a very good thing. Um, but the, you've touched on two specific things there. One, um, this relates to how do we fund. I think we're all in agreement this is really important, but we come back to the nutty problem of how do you fund it. And I, I think I have to, to pick up the comments. That we, the temptation is to go back to the same model every time, and if we keep going back to that, it's not going to get any better, is it? It's not going to fix within the, the confines of how we've been doing it to date. It's not working. Um, I do think this depends on a combination on a spectrum from engaging with the individual as to why this matters, so campaigns that actually build awareness as to why it matters. And I d The difference with smoking was it's what, what was in it for the individual, so w what is in it for the individual to keep places tidy, and actually that then relates to climate change, it relates to our environment, it, rem it relates to all the things that the nation's young people have got excited about out there actually as to why these things matter. So I think you have to relate w why it matters to the individual through to, and why does it matter to all these other partners? So why does it matter to the, I don't know, to the private sector, to developers? Well, of course, green space make places nicer to live in. It, therefore, it increases the, the, the value of the, the houses you're trying to sell. Why does it matter to local business? Well, you want to attract talent to your business. You want to have somewhere nice to live. So why does it matter to people that these places are looked after? And therefore, is there a correlation to the money I put in? I actually get something back from it. And I think we haven't been clever enough in making that relationship clear. Up until now, it's been a green space is important. It's very much dependent now, I think, on understanding why it is important and what the return on the investment, and that's not just financial return, what, what that looks like. And I do think there needs to be just simply around a campaign around time. There's, I'm going to use this word now, I really don't know whether to shoot. There's litter and then there's dog poo, which is the other thing that my life, my post bag is full of. Um, <laughs> But those two things, actually, genuinely, they matter to people. They really matter to people. Um, and that is about education. That is about engagement. That is about why, why did these things matter to me? So. Well, I am so pleased to be able to talk more about litter. And I have a confession. I really wanted to put something in my platform speech about litter, but unfortunately, the timing was so tight that uh, it got edited out. But uh, it is just... I mean, to, to be able to make a significant difference on litter in this country would just have a, make a huge difference to people's overall levels of contentment, happiness. And therefore, I, I, I think you make some valid points about the plan for extended producer responsibility. And um, this is a conversation with Her Majesty's Treasury. Um, there is some indication that um, if there is a if local authorities are to be mandated for separate food collections, that might be funded through the EPR, but uh, I, I can see that you make an attractive case for saying that um, some of the cost of collecting up that plastic packaging from our parks and open spaces might be appropriate to be funded via the EPR, but I have to say that uh, decisions on that are dependent on the Treasury and have yet to be made, but I will, I will take that as a representation and feed it into the uh, decision-making process. And in terms of an anti-litter public information campaign, I mean, I, I have a lot of sympathy with that. As ever, resources are an issue, but I mean, we have tremendously successful examples of public information campaigns run by government. You mentioned smoking, drink driving is another one. Road safety, the Think campaign has been phenomenally successful. So if I possibly can, I shall try and find some extra resources to boost the brilliant efforts made by Keep Britain Tidy to convince people to stop dropping litter. And as I say, if we can actually make a difference on this, whether locally or nationally, I think we can, you know, we can have a real sense of achievement because we will be like making life better for millions of people across our country. James. Well, I say all power to Theresa's elbow in having those conversations with the Treasury <laughs> in uh, making that case out. But I think there is a very important relationship issue as well between local government and the work that is taking place with the uh, Environment Bill and just how that funding does get allocated. And so I think it's absolutely right that we're sort of flagging that up as a conversation which does need to be had. And it's also how we need to continue to advance the community's agenda. 
which I think still lies at the heart of all of this. So I'm just refreshing myself on what we said in the framework on what a strong community is, and it's about people, place, and local pride. And on that latter point, that comes from the connection between people and place and generating, I suppose, a shared sense of belonging and local identity. Now, there are a whole raft of different recommendations and action points that came through from the community's framework. The important thing is that we get behind that and actually drive that work forward. Because I think it is about that sense of, as you know, I was doing last week on a community litter pick. And therefore, not just about what government or what a voluntary organisation can do, but how collectively we all have a part to play, which does profoundly come to the prevention agenda and how we actually start to think more carefully about the environment around us. I think there's a real opportunity with the next generation coming through, the greenest group of people that I think we've ever seen, and in a good way, of thinking about conserving for the future, about our environment. We need to harness that through schools, through other programmes as well. And I think it is, again, that sense of will. If we can put our shoulder to the wheel, there is no reason why we can't make this happen. Mm -hmm. I just said, Councillor Green, how to be for one member? <coughs> yeah, I, I th just following on from what James has said there, I think the schools play an integral part in this. We've done quite a lot of, um, I mean, I, I completely understand the national campaign thing, but I, I, I do think it, it comes back to local, local, local ownership of areas that actually genuinely want to make a difference to their own areas, but I, I, I'm not averse to it. I think, you know, school poster competitions are simple as that start at an early age, get them thinking about what the implications are. I know we have environmental um, assemblies that we, we have in our area, and as you mentioned earlier, the Obviously, I won't go into detail, but the posters around the dog poo were, were quite illuminating from the children. Um, but, um, <laughs> but, but, but I just think all this brings that, go back to that point of ownership that, that we all have. And, and actually, you know, you always get that argument, you get it on social media, you go, oh, we shouldn't have to do that, you know, we should go out and pick up litter, we should, should be doing that. But at the end of the day, um, it's, you know, it's, it's about, a, you know, a local pride in the area. And actually, in... in well, I think we've over, I think 200 or something local litter pickers that go out every week now. The council enables that to happen. They provide the bags, they provide the litter pickers, they go and collect the litter, they have to they have their points where, we, where they have to be dropped, and the council will then go around and collect them with their normal uh, rounds. So I, I think there are lots of ways that we can all work together and enable uh, a, a society that we're all quite proud of. There's still a heck of a long way to go. And going on to the recyclable plastics, I think... I think we need to move to an area where there is a clear indication to people that when they do something, it will help that particular area. Yeah. And I think we've not got that, and I've not got the answers to that. But I think if you get that, if people... So even if people decide to shop in a certain shop, they know that that shop, there is a percentage, even if it's only a small percentage, helps towards a park. And I think we're looking at those kind of initiatives and community initiatives... Um, that, that can help those areas. But I think there's a lot of areas like that where if people know they're benefiting a certain, it's the same issue with the trees as well, if they know certain aspects are directly correlating to their own choices in life, then I think that's an area that we should as a government be moving towards. Okay. Uh, hands up for questions, please. Um, so there's a gentleman in the green tie and then uh, the gentleman at the front here. That's right. and please, one sentence of a question mark on you. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Um, I'm Benedict McLean, and I work for Policy Exchange on environment issues. Um, we recently published a, um, uh, a proposal for a, a Nature in the City Act, which would mandate local councils to um, uh, to not overmanage their uh, their parks and green spaces, and thereby save money and improve biodiversity through allowing allowing wildness back in. I wonder what your thoughts on that might be. And then the gentleman at the front in the red to purple design. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Jim Clark from Thames Water. Um, we are working and we're spending millions of pounds in greening some of the urban spaces. And as, as Theresa said, these are great for preventing flooding and treating water quality. The problem is that they've been shrinking and they've been shrinking for quite a long time. We've lost 7% of urban green space since, since 2001. Uh, what can government do to sort of help companies like ours to work with local authorities who are under pressure? Okay, um, we'll go from right to left, and these can be kind of closing remarks at the same time, as I know we have to keep the schedule. If that's right, so cut. Cracking. 
Um, uh, I, I'm afraid I'm not an expert about rewilding, uh, despite my surname. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm actually going to come back to sort of the earlier point about, about trust people. Trust them because they want to get involved. That's what I see everywhere. And, and, and sort of the yeah. example about litter picking, if you go to sort of the, the beach at Cromer, there's a 10-minute volunteering opportunity there with a litter picker and a bag, and you can mm -hmm. go out and do your bit. We've got to try and get out of the way, and we've got to recognise that the community is a resource, that philanthropy is a potential partner uh, in all of this. And, uh, James, you've done fantastic stuff, but my, my message to you as the audience, I genuinely think this community's agenda is up for grabs. Yeah. I really do. I don't think... I've been to all the political parties this, this summer, this autumn, and I just don't think anyone really has quite grasped it yet. So it's there. Mm. James. Thank you. And I think Carl's point about trusting people is one that, as Conservatives, we naturally lend to, and therefore why we should be able to grasp that agenda. And I think that there's some framework that we can now build from and really own this and make this something that we can take out and underline. Because profoundly, as Conservatives, we believe in communities. We believe in neighbourhoods. We believe in trusting people. And it's interesting that the, the points about the green spaces and, I suppose, that protection... I, I take the view that, yes, we do need to deliver on our housing agenda, but we shouldn't be just building all over our green belt to do that. Um, I think we need to be more imaginative, we need to be more creative, and if we really are celebrating our green spaces and places, I think we need to challenge ourselves on how we deliver, but equally how we safeguard our green belt and the things that make our country the special and precious place that it is. So I think that's certainly one way in which we can help on that agenda. And, and I think on the, on the issue of, of wildness, well, certainly I'll, I'll look at the policy exchange paper, but yeah, we can be imaginative. If there's a way in which we can promote biodiversity, then we should be. And I think it's about having that conversation. And if we get greater community involvement and community engagement, that I think will help define and decide on some of those factors and indeed may help advance that. We have a copy of the paper at the back. Um, Theresa. Well, I, I would just like to sum up by, I think this meeting has demonstrated once again how strongly committed Conservatives are and all, always have been to conservation of our natural environment and our stewardship of our parks and open spaces in towns and cities is something that I know every Conservative council in office across the country takes extremely seriously. And today's discussion has highlighted the importance of those, um, those green spaces for all sorts of reasons, whether it's health, um, flood risk prevention, um, or this great challenge we face as a planet to reduce carbon emissions. And I want to strongly echo and endorse what James has just said about the green belt being vital for the protection of our quality of life, both inside and outside the city, that, that green buffer zone to prevent urban sprawl is absolutely a core part of this government's environmental policy and I hope always will be for future governments as well. On, uh, on rewilding, um, this, is, uh, this is difficult territory. I know that it, it, it sharply polarises opinions. Um, it certainly has its merits, but particularly in rural areas, I think we need to take into account the interests of food, food security and farming as well. I'm not saying there's always a conflict between the two, but we have to take care to ensure that um, you know, the farming is a sort of core driver of our way of life in the countryside, that their interests are taken into account when we make decisions on rewilding programmes. But I just want to wind up by thanking Policy Exchange and the National Trust and all of you for what I think has been a great discussion about a really important subject. Um, here we go. I guess the first thing to say is I'm really heartened by what I've heard today. Clearly, we do all recognise that public parks in particular have um, a very diverse range of benefits that they bring to, to people and to nature, um, everything from health through to biodiversity and, and everything in between. So, so that feels great. It doesn't quite solve the problem, though. The problem hasn't gone away. You've just said we've lost 7% of our green space. So the problem has not gone away. But what we are pointing to is a couple of things really important, which is, for me, trusting people. 
because we know our communities love these places. They want to feel part of it. They want to be part of the solution. So trust. But that of itself will not also be the, the solution. I, for me, there is innovation needed here to think about how we work with other partners, be that the private sector, be that the, be that local local government. We need to think more widely as to how that might work. And we've had a, suggestions about potential for releasing assets to create endowments. All of these things need to be looked at really seriously. And I guess the programme we're involved in is intended to try to test those. But the challenge will be to scale that up across the country. Um, I, I think the, the last thing to say is that the these places are so important. And the moment is right now. It isn't in five years' time or 10 years' time because they'll be gone, um, because they'll be built over, they'll be lost. We need some action straight away. So I, I think the support in the room is really important, but it, it is an issue that we need you to take back and, and affect tomorrow. Thank you, Hugh. Councillor Greenhalgh, in yep. 20 seconds, please. Yeah, right. Well, wildflowers, yes, we're doing it, and we're a Conservative council, so of course we've chosen blue lupins. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, the, the threat of the uh, green belt is huge. All I would say as, a, as, as, as to government as well is when we do develop, which we are doing a lot of brownfield sites, let's make sure we don't just replace them with equally just a whole mass of concrete that we actually, yeah. within the planning Absolutely. system, ensure yeah. Yeah. that we actually um, uh, develop some real green pockets within our towns as well. And uh, I just would end by saying this is absolutely something that we should be getting hold of. This is a political just, just benefit for us. It brings communities together and it, it, it actually engages with families, young families. I'm going to be, be a bit political, but I'm going to say it actually... I know from experience it connects with an age group that we're struggling with, which is predominantly uh, young mums, uh, 20, 30, 40-year-olds, who we have seen with all the stats that we've got, we are, we're struggling just to, to get that, that vote back as much as we would like. And we are doing something positive that that age group absolutely loves. But apart from the fact that it's politically good, it's actually well worth doing as well. So that's yeah. my end. Brilliant. Um, well, may I ask you to clap again for the audience? No, sorry, for, the, for the speakers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.